sometimes you have multiple versions of a gene or the corresponding proteins, and if these come from the same genetic ancestor, we call them homologs. We can further break these down into paralogs, which are basically where you have a genetic duplication event so that there ends up the instructions for making that protein. So for the gene for that protein gets duplicated, so now you have two of those, and those can evolve separately. This can be in the same species, so you can get like ego one through four in a person, or they can be in different species. Then what we typically talk about when we're talking about different species are orthologs. Now orthologs are homologs that share a common ancestor um, and then they underwent a speciation event, so the creation of two new species. So basically this protein um, evolved and then their species like split apart. And so they both have the gene for making that protein and now those can evolve separately. So what happens with homologs is because you have a shared genetic ancestry, but then you have the opportunity for these genes to evolve um, separately, you can get these and products can be more specialized for various functions. They can differ dramatically in their function or even in the, their straight sequence or their structure, but they're characterized by having that core, um, that genetic ancestry. And so they may or may not be able to say functionally compensate for one another. So if you were to remove one of them, you might be able to add to one of the others, if it was in the same cell, might be able to compensate. Or if you were to like add it externally, then it might be able to compensate, but it might not. And so sometimes we don't even realize things are homologs when they are. But other times we think things are homologs, but they're really not. In these cases, what we're talking about typically are analogs. So these are things that act or look similar, but they don't share that same genetic origin. This can happen because of something called convergent evolution, where basically, there's different species and they both kind of are evolution was randomly there's mutations that randomly happen and then evolution is going to favor those that give a growth advantage or a selective advantage and so the things that are advantageous for the organism so that allow it to outcompete the others are going to be passed forward and so they might there are different routes though that these mutations because they're happening randomly they can kind of stumble across the same cool thing and in this case we can end up with two things that look similar but they actually share a different genetic origin um, so we can have both like bats and birds being able to fly even though they didn't inherit that ability to fly from the same ancestor. So this is called convergent evolution and as the end result when this happens with proteins um, or with genes we call these analogs and we can say that these traits or these proteins are analogous. These are not homologous but they are analogous um, and so these are some of the basic terminology but then we also have some complications where the terminology is kind of used incorrectly. So you might see people talk about sequence homology. Sometimes you'll see people talk about percent homology. This is a misnomer. So homology is a yes or no. The sequences either share a common evolutionary ancestry, that is they are homologous, or they don't, they aren't homologous. And so often when people use this term percent homology, what they're often really meaning is sequence similarity. So how similar two sequences are, we can't use this term percent homology to um, talk about this, but we can use a couple of different terms. We can use percent identity or percent similarity. So the percent identity is going to be the percentage of identical residue. So this is going to be like the same letters, like how many of the nucleotides of DNA or letter or RNA letters, or how many of the protein letters, the amino acids, what percentage of those are identical. And then we can talk about percent similarity, which is basically the percent of the residues or the letters that are similar, but they're not the same. So if we're talking about proteins, this might be say, substituting a one negatively charged amino acid for another negatively charged amino acid. We would say that that would be um, similar Whereas if you were to change a negatively charged amino acid for a positively charged amino acid, well, that would not be similar. Um, and so often homologous genes or proteins are going to have high sequence similarity, but not necessarily because they can evolve to have, because they have that separate evolution after their common ancestry, they can actually evolve to be quite different.
Um, and conversely, genes or proteins with high sequence similarity often are not always, but not always are homologous. So sometimes software will try to predict the genetic origins and genetic ancestry and the evolutionary paths of things based on the degree of um, sequence similarity. So on the, just a quick um, technical note, when I say that things are either homologous or they aren't, well, it's also possible that regions of a gene strain will be homologous, while others are not. But that's not talk, when we're talking, about, we're not talking about like percent homology in terms of taking all of the different letters for a, the, the entire sequence of a gene and then saying, okay, well, what percent of it is the same? Um, that would be like percentage, um, this, this is referring to sequence similarity, this wouldn't be homology. So a region of that protein might be homologous or that region of that gene might be homologous with a region of another gene, um, but other regions might not be, say if you kind of like cut and paste regions of different genes in order to make a new function, parts of those could be homologous, but that's not what we're talking about when people are talking about like percent homology um, when they're really meaning sequence similarity. Because remember, homology is in, defined in terms of the evolutionary origin, so that part of a gene might be, have the same evolutionary origin, whereas the other part might not. But again, that's not the same as the sequence similarity is not the same as like percent homology. And so, um, but you often see this term percent homology, but don't get confused about it. Um, so speaking of how you can actually look at and look and see similarity. A common tool that you'll use is Uniprot. Um, so Uniprot is basically like the main database for protein information. If you go to Uniprot and say you search a protein of interest, you can find a lot of different homologs of it. I studied this protein in um, grad school called Argonaut or Ega. And don't worry about what it does. It's this RNA interference protein. It's really cool. And I have a lot more on it in my in past posts. But basically what you need to know about here is that it has four, um, it has four paralogs. So in the human version, in the humans, we have ego one through ego four. And so these are basically genetic duplication, but there could be multiple copies of this gene in our DNA, which could then specialize. Um, and so they have a high degree of similarity as we'll see, um, but there's four different versions. And so we call these paralogs. Now, this gene arose pretty early on, and so it's shared along multiple different species. So you can see that there's also an ego 2 ortholog in mice. And so we can call all of these para we can call all of these homologs um, because it all arose from that early argonaut protein, uh, that early argonaut gene. These are paralogs, they um they're in the same, they're basically different versions of the protein but within the same species. And then we have orthologs, which is a different version in another species. Now I should also note though, that the mouse is also going to have um, ego one through four because that the evolution of those paralogs happened really early on. So we actually share those with the mice too. So it's, it's a bit complicated in terms of the terminology, but we can refer to these as paralogs because they came from genetic duplication events. And these as orthologs because they um, they arose from the same genetic ancestor, um, but they're in like the same actual gene, but they're in different species. Okay, so now what you can do is if you go to Blast, if you click on something, you can click on this like add add to basket or add to cart, and it's kind of like your shopping um, your shopping cart, except that it's all free. Um, and what can you do for free? Well, one of the lots of things, one of the things you can do is you can do this align. And so if you go to the alignment, there's gonna be a lot of different options you can use. Um, but if you just do the, just use the genetic or generic um, defaults, you'll get something that looks like this. And so basically you have all the different sequences and you're seeing it highlighted by the similarity. Um, and so you can see that sequence that where you have things that are like identical, you're gonna get this dark purple. When you have things that are similar, what you see is you get um, you get a lighter a lighter shade. So, for example, if we look here, you see that ego two has um, F, so this is phenylalanine, and the other argonauts have Y, so they have a tyrosine. 
And we see that it's this, they're not the same, but they are similar. And so you can see that phenylalanine and tyrosine, well, these are both what we call aromatic amino acids. And so they have this similar like ring structure, but tyrosine has an OH here. Um, and so things like that, we can talk about how similar they are um, based on how similar the amino acids are. And so basically you can have some of this, if you conserve the like functional conservation, um, if, you, if you're using similar amino acids then the protein is likely having a, would likely be able to carry out a similar function. And so if something's evolving, um, so to, you're kind of conserving the function of that protein, even though you're changing the actual sequence. Um, whereas other reasons you can see there's not much um, similarity at all. And then we can also talk about sequence identity or percent identity, so the percentage of identical letters. Um, and so if you go back to your BLAST and you click on the percent identity matrix, it's going to show you a matrix where you're comparing each of these sequences. And so you'll see on the diagonal, you're gonna have 100% because this is basically comparing ego 2 human to ego 2 human. You can see that the next closest is ego 2 mouse to ego 2 human. So we have these orthologs are going to be the closest to another, they're closer to one another, even though they're in different species, they're closer to one another than the orthologs are to one another, than to these like different versions of the, um, of the ego protein are. Even though these are all within the human, they have more variation than with, um, with the mice, so they have a higher similarity. Say we wanted to know what the structure of the mouse argonaut look like. And so we can see that they have a really high degree, it has a really high degree of similarity to the human argonaut. So we know the structure of the human argonaut protein. X-ray crystallography has been used to um, solve its crystal structure. So basically show what it looks like in 3D. But what if we want to know what the mouse version looks like in 3D? So we know they have similar sequences and we're guessing that they're gonna have really similar structures. So what we can do is we can kind of you overlay the sequence of the mouse argonaut onto the sequences, the structure of a human argonaut to get a predicted structure of the mouse argonaut. And so a common tool for doing this is Swiss model. Um, and it's this great tool. I started using it in, um, in undergraduate. It actually played a part in my research project. And because we need, there was a structure for one species, but not the one I was working on. Um, and so the Swiss model tool, it doesn't just like overlay the sequence, it also does some like optimization and things in order to try to predict the actual structure. Another place you might see the word homologous used is with homologous recombination. So basically this is where two regions of um, genetic sequences that are really similar kind of swap places. And this can happen in this process called crossing over. Um, so basically, when our cells duplicate, we have a chromosome, we have two copies of each chromosome. And because those are going to have really, really similar, um, really, really similar sequences, what you can get is you can get this phenomenon called crossing over where the similar sequences kind of uh, match up and then swap. Um, so this is one form of homologous recombination. Homologous repair is also used. So basically what happens is that if, this is one of the things that is sometimes done with CRISPR is that if you get a break in the DNA, um, then if you have a piece that kind of matches, those matching pieces can kind of get stitched together. Or if you have damage to one strand, the other, um, the other copy of, or if you have damage to one like chromosome, the version of another chromosome can be the other chromosome can be used as a sort of template for template for filling it in. And so we call this like homology director repair. Um, if you don't have a, any matching sequence or whatever, then they kind of, the cells kind of have to stitch things together with like non-homologous end joining or NHEG, EHA, which is um, more likely to cause errors. Um, and so this is just a technical note that you'll see this term homologous recombination used. So in this case, we're not um, in like homology directed repair, but in this case, um, sometimes we're not actually, the sequences actually aren't technically homologous, they just are very similar.
um, but we can be adding this like external artificial DNA, which wouldn't have a similar genetic origin, but it would have the same sequence. But typically when we're talking about homologs, we're talking in terms in homology, we're talking in terms of things that share a common genetic, um, a common evolutionary ancestry. And remember that if the ancestry, if the species, if these two things are similar because they split off after, um, so there was like a speciation event, they split off into separate species after they, after that gene or that protein evolved, then we call these orthologs. If they arise from a genetic duplication, then we call these paralogs. Um, and don't confuse these with analogs, which are things that look or act similar, but they come from gen different genetic sources. They just happen to um, arise through like convergent evolution.